Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Pirate Perspectives. I'm Count Zero. Forgive me for the background noise. We are having a rainstorm, and also people watching TV in the other room, and not much I can do about that. We are continuing with our coverage of Nintendo Power's fourth year with issue number 33 for January of 1992. Last issue had a big shake-up of the format with some changes for the better. Let's take a look at how that changes up this issue of the magazine. Our cover game for this issue is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, The Manhattan Project. This is a title that generally slips through the cracks in coverage of the series, so I'm interested in discussing it this issue. The art itself is really good, looking almost like a recreation of the suit designs from the live-action films. And it's got a few issues, though. Raph's left arm, appear arm appears not to have an elbow, and his left leg appears to be twisted in the sense that it looks like Raph injured his leg and is dragging it behind him as he makes his way back to the sewer in safety. The letters column this issue has a selection of photographs of people taking Nintendo Power on vacation. However, of greater interest is more envelope art submissions. We have several envelopes with art from Battletoads and one with art from Final Fantasy 1. Next, we have our cover game, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. And it's coming out early since it's an NES game. In this title, Shredder has stolen New York City, and it's up to the Turtles to free it. We have maps of the first six levels. The incidental art here is alright, and the maps are fairly comprehensive. There's a weird bit where the article describes Shredder as Bogard. I'm not sure what they're trying to refer to here. There's Bogart, which is generally stoner slang for someone who hogs a joint. But I'm pretty sure Shredder's not the kind of guy to toke up. Now the game is, frankly, not as good a brawler as TMNT2 was. Not that it's not an entertaining game, it's just it's not quite as good. The Sprites are smaller, and I encountered some significant slowdown with some of the, with the auto scroller levels. I realize I am running this on an emulator for purposes of gameplay capture, but I have a pretty good rig, and I'm using an emulator that's tuned for accurately replicating how a game would perform on the NES. So if this game is hitting slowdown on my computer, it would hit similar slowdown on the NES, which I consider a significant minus. Next up is the second GI Joe game we've covered thus far. G.I. Joe The Atlantis Fa Factor, this time from Capcom. The game has borrowed the overworld structure from Bionic Commando, allowing you to select your own path through the game. We have maps and notes on the first four routes, and the first three Cobra bases. Here's the thing from Bionic Commando, and what Capcom failed to learn from that game. Bionic Commando is a game which rewarded player exploration. The player had multiple lives, lives giving them multiple shots at boss fights, and the game's bosses had well-designed patterns to them, making it fun to figure out the patterns and find various power-ups on the game's levels. In this game, you have basically one life, and the bosses don't have any real pattern to them. They just kind of run up and attack you, making them battles of attrition rather than battles of skill. I'm rather disappointed with this game, though I was hoping for a game structurally inspired by the command by the Bionic Commando series, considering that the overworld map was designed that way. No such luck. Next is Rampart. We haven't had a major arcade port in a while, and this is a port of arcades of uh, the arcade tower defense game from Atari. The article has some general gameplay notes. Rampart is a very old-school, quarter-muncher-inspired arcade game with a little bit of Tetris-inspired puzzle elements. You have a fortress wall around your castles. You pick one, and then you have five more you can expand your walls around. And you build cannons within those walls. After that, enemy ships will attack, and you fire cannon shells at them. In between rounds of combat, you can patch up the walls with pieces with various shapes, and you can even expand those walls. However, you can't select your pieces, and you can only work with the pieces you're presented with. If you don't have an enclosed fortress when time's up in between rounds, it's game over. Further, as the game processes, enemy ships will land infantry. If infantry is standing in a square, you can't build any castle walls in that square, and your shells from the cannon don't do splash damage, so they aren't effective at defeating enemy infantry, just defeating enemy ships. So consequently, in single player, you have a very clear you-will-lose situation as soon as infantry starts showing up. This is basically a game designed to create unwinnable situations. 
This works in the arcade where eventually you want to stop playing and eat your pizza or go play a different game, and the person running the arcade wants you to feed in more quarters. And further, um, there is the whole matter of the score, high score table on the arcade machine, giving you incentive to keep playing or keep feeding quarters in because you want to beat that high score. For a home video game with no online leaderboards or anything like that, all those incentives are pretty much gone, which really hurts this game and makes it not something I recommend. Well, we've got us another The Simpsons game with The Simpsons, Bart vs. The World. I hope this one doesn't suck. We got notes on some of the levels and minigames for those levels, specifically China, the North Pole, and Egypt, along with information on those levels' bosses. This game does suck. It is utterly dire. The minigames are terrible and the controls are crappy. The only bit that might be appealing is the trivia questions, but to be honest, I never really watched The Simpsons during this era, so I can't really judge the trivia portion of this game. Just give this game a miss. Even if you're in it for the interested in the trivia, there are probably better The Simpsons dedicated trivia games. The Link to the Past comic continues with Link on the run and in search of the Master Sword. In classified information, we get a whole bunch of tips on how to improve your city and get certain rewards in SimCity. We're moving on to the Game Boy coverage with Gradius, Interstellar Ast Assault, the latest installment in Konami's series. We have maps of the first few levels of the game. The problem Gradius Interstellar Assault has is the same problem that the earlier R-Type game for the Game Boy had. You simply don't have enough room to maneuver around enemy bullets, obstacles, and, well, enemies. The developers at Konami at least had the good sense to recognize that you needed to shrink the size of the Vic Viper sprite to give it room to maneuver on screen. They just didn't do that with the sprites of enemies and their bullets. The majority of bullet spites in this game are about the same size as your ship, compared to the home console and arcade versions of the series where their bullets were the same size as your bullets. This is doubly odd, as your bullets have appeared to have shrunk some as well, to reflect the size of your ship. I honestly recommend sticking with the mainline Gradius series of games. We have another Ocean title this issue with Super Hunchback, a port of an arcade platformer. We have maps of the first three levels. Well, this is the best Ocean game we've gotten thus far, which is damning with faint praise. It's a, also a fairly mediocre platformer, which speaks volumes that the only good Ocean game just manages to be mediocre. This game does manage to balance having sprites with character and a field of view that lets you plan ahead fairly well, but there's nothing about this game that particularly grabs me. I realize that this series has been in existence in arcades and on PCs for quite some time, but it's ultimately not a game with much character to it. It's just... it's a platformer. It's competent. It works. That's all it does. Continuing with our Game Boy titles, we have Terminator 2 Judgment Day. We have maps of the first four stages, before giving some notes on the fifth and final stage. This is a pretty crappy game. I am generally not a fan of action games that give you a game over after one death, unless that game also has the good sense to give the player a bunch of health power-ups. This game doesn't do that. It throws a lot of enemies at you, along with the puzzle at the start of the game that basically requires you to restart the game if you mess up. Skip this game. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. It's just... It's a bad LJN-licensed game. Next, we move on to a couple more arcade ports with Game Boy versions of Qbert and Asteroids, with notes on both. So let's start with Qbert. I'm not a fan of Qbert. I find the game rather boring, and the difficulty of the game based more on the increasing size of the game's levels and number of enemies rather than actual complexity to the game. Yeah, you have more enemies, and they have different movement patterns, but it's just that the maps are bigger. It's All they are is big. That's not necessarily helpful, and additionally, because of the size of the Game Boy screen, you don't have all of the map on your screen, 
So, for example, if you have an enemy that is changing the color of the tiles, you can't tell there's an enemy changing the color of the tiles and account for that in your movements, which would, in theory, in theory add some strategy and planning. Instead, you just have your very limited viewpoint. I will say this for Cupert. It is the only game I've covered thus far that has handled isometric movement well. Specifically, it does this by moving the character in discrete, distinct spaces with each movement, rather than having you be able to move basically anywhere in three dimensions, which in turn consequently requires you to have to judge distance with your camera angle. Asteroids, on the other hand, is, well, Asteroids. It is a good enough port of Asteroids. It plays the same, except the actual Asteroids are more round sprites as opposed to um, the sort of wireframe digitized graphics that they were in the original game. Um, wireframe is exactly the right word because it wasn't 3D, but it is a an outline of what the asteroid shape would be. Additionally, it avoids the problem that the 2600 version of Asteroids had where if you sit in the middle of the screen, you are otherwise completely safe. I, still, this game does have the problem that the size of the Game Boy screen makes it feel more confining than it did in the original game. It's a decent port, but the Source game is one I'd still prefer to play on a console instead of a portable device. That said, the game doesn't have enough to it to really merit a full-on NES port. Um, at least not one they're willing to pick up. Maybe if it was, com maybe it was compiled with a bunch of other games... I would find it more of interest. In this installment of Super Mario Adventures, for this issue, Bowser decides to hold the Mushroom Kingdom hostage, with the cost being Princess Peach's hand in marriage. Peach is having absolutely none of this, and rather than being kidnapped, heads off in pursuit of Bowser, with Mario and Luigi following along behind. Why can't we get more of this version of Peach in the video games? Really? This is a take-charge, no-nonsense character who still is can be all sweet and that sort of thing when she's not getting Bowser to go, go away. In any case, moving on, we have the first of the Goemon games to get a U.S. release here with Legend of the Mystical Ninja, though the characters' names have been, distressingly, made into bad stereotypes of quote-unquote, oriental names. Kid Ying and Dr. Yang. I suppose I should be grateful that the names weren't changed to Kid Ching and Dr. Chong, but that's probably too many letters for the very large typeface they use in-game. The article itself gives a rundown in all of the, all the mini-games and shops you find in each town, along with a map of the first action level and notes of, on subsequent levels with village maps of the first four cities being on the poster. It bears mentioning that the synopsis of each level sticks with the names from the Japanese version of the game. So, you're starting in the town of, of Hagure, near Edo, moving on to Hiotoko Village, and so on. I apologize for mentioning the names. So, the Ching Chong Ding Dong names for given to our main characters was a decision made by Konami. Still, I don't know of the fact that the developers were doing this, or to the characters, or the, rather the U.S. publishers, were doing this to characters of the same ethnicity as the developers, if that whole thing is better or worse than the racist names that we got for the antagonist in the U.S. release of Metal Gear on the NES. Anyway, gameplay-wise, Legend of the Mystical Ninja is a fun game, but it's also a game that's kind of unforgiving and kind of grindy. You power up your weapons through random drops from enemies, and your speed jump, speed and jump height from power-ups you buy from shops. Getting you hit causes you to drop your jump height by one and your weapon upgrade by one, which can be, depending on how far you've gotten upgraded, a tremendous setback and is actually a little more unforgiving than the Castlevania games are. Yeah, when you die in Castlevania, you lose all your weapon power-ups, but you have a health bar and you can take a few hits before you die. And usually, when you die, the next few candles you run into will have power-ups for your whip that will get you back up to full fairly promptly. Now, this isn't to say that Legend of the Mystical Ninja isn't fun. It is fun. But it also means this game is one that actually requires more of a long stretch for play as opposed to just sitting down and playing it whenever. 
which kind of causes a problem for the show, because that's how I play games for this show, because I have so many games to get through per episode. Still, if you can find a copy affordably, it's definitely something that's worth checking out. We come next to the second SNES RPG we've covered. Ease 3, Wanderers from Ease. This is kind of doubly of note, as the NES ports of Ease Books 1 and 2 never got a US release on the NES. The MS-DOS versions did make it out here, so it is possible that people buying this game had played er earlier installments of the series, but still, that may be a bit of a stretch. In any case, this is the first, well, console port of the Ease games to come out, at least on a Nintendo console thus far. We have maps of some of the early areas in the game, and I should note that they brought back their incidental artist from the earlier Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy articles for the incidental art here, and it looks great. The article covers the game through Gabal for Gabalan Island. I apologize for mangling the pronunciation of that name. The Ease games are some of the grindiest RPGs in the history of consoles, and Ease 3 is pretty much no exception. Like Zelda 2, the game shifts from a top-down perspective to a side-scrolling perspective. Though, I'd say the shift works a little better, better here than in Zelda 2, with the change of level design and the added detail that you get with a 16-bit console. The game is still fun to play, and the music is still great. Frankly, I don't think I've ever played an Ease game with bad mu music. Blah. That said, this game has also been heavily remade, with the most recent remake as Ease the Oath and Felgana being available on PC and the PSP, and thus by extension, also on the Vita and the PlayStation TV. If you're going to pick this game up, I would honestly recommend going with the remake over this original SNES version, partially because it'll actually be easier to find, because you can just go out and get it right now, and also because there's some gameplay tweaks to make it a little easier to play. Now the time has come for the Super Nintendo to have its own light gun, and it's shipping with a collection of mini-games known as the Super Scope 6. Because I'm capturing most of this footage with an emulator, and if it wasn't my TVs and LCD, I can't really properly review these games. Um, yeah, I could just do the shooting with my mouse, but then if I'm doing the shooting with my mouse, I'm really not actually replicating how accurate the light gun is and that sort of stuff. Still, in any case, we have notes on f two of the games here. As an aside, due to the Famicom, Famicom Sniper segments of Game Center CX, I'm finding it completely impossible to take the design of the Super Scope seriously. I just keep thinking of the f of just Areno, and I realize I'm mangling his name, on the op in the offices, staring out the window with a pair of binoculars strapped to the Super Scope, trying to see what game somebody's handing to one of the ADs is handing to another AD at the intersection below the building. Anyway, moving on. In Counselor's Corner, we have a Cliff Notes overview of how to rescue Rosa in Final Fantasy 2, or 4, depending on which port you're playing. This issue, in Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is playing Super Castlevania 4, where he learns a valuable lesson from Simon Belmont. Sometimes it's better to run past enemies over fighting everything. I am really pleased that the quality appears to be returning to Nestor's Adventures. I'm also kind of wishing that Nestor's Adventures had its second page back to give the tips a bit more time to be set up and give the jokes room to breathe. In the Now Playing Review column, we've noticed a review of Blaster Master Boy for the Game Boy, which was panned by our two reviewers. In our Top 20 column this issue, it is dominated by Mario on all three platforms. This issue's celeb profile is doubling up, with Kelly Williams and Darius McCrary from Family Matters appearing. Williams is still acting, primarily in sitcoms, and McCrary is also acting. In the article, it mentions that McCrary was working on an album, and as of this writing, that album still hasn't come out yet in the past decade. Two decades, actually. Anyway, McCreary's acting roles have been more of a mix of comedic and dramatic work as opposed to Williams' just sticking with com comedy. In Packwatch, Contra 3 is on the way for the Super Nintendo. I'm looking forward to that. This issue, we don't exactly have an obvious pick, so I'm just going with one this time. I'm going to go with The Legend of the Mystical Ninja as my pick of the week, though I do also recommend picking up Ease, The Oath, and Felgana, particularly since odds are good that it will end up available cheap 
in a Steam sale. Next issue, I've already looked ahead, and our cover game is Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. This is a biggie, so look forward to that next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please support my Patreon. Link will be below in the show notes. There's also going to be a link on the YouTube channel up here somewhere. Thank you very much for watching. See you once again. I'll see you next time.